placement of the ta ware in this location on the mummy case takes on a further symbolic significance. As you can see, it's located at something approximately in the area of Pa'ankanamun's nether regions, kinda sorta in the phallus area. Although being god of the dead, the cult of Osiris also has a distinct fertility aspect, both vegetative as a god of agriculture and sexual. The classical Greek historian and traveler Herodotus has a somewhat amusing account of an Egyptian festival to Osiris in his book nowadays simply called The Histories. Here's a translation of that passage by Aubrey de Selincourt. It's in Book 2, Section 48. Oh, and the Greeks have this thing where they associate the gods of other lands with their own gods, and the association can sometimes be on a pretty deep level. So here Osiris is constantly referred to as Dionysus. In other ways, the Egyptian method of celebrating the festival of Dionysus is much the same as the Greek, except that the Egyptians have no choric dance. Instead of the phallus, they have puppets about 18 inches high. The genitals of these figures are made almost as big as the rest of the bodies, and they're pulled up and down by strings as women carry them around the villages. Flutes lead the procession, and the women as they follow sing a hymn to Dionysus. There is a religious legend to account for the size of the genitals, and the fact that they are the only part of the puppet's body which is made to move. Unfortunately, Herodotus doesn't really offer any sort of explanation of this religious legend, but presumably he's referring to the Egyptian myth of Osiris's murder at the hands of his jealous brother Set, who then dismembers the body and scatters it all over Egypt. Isis, the wife and sister of Osiris, then goes around collecting all the pieces and reassembles his body. The only piece that's missing is the phallus, eaten by a fish. She cleverly fashions a phallus for Osiris out of the rich, fertile Nile silt, what the Egyptians planted all their crops in, and from this she conceives their son Horus. The final major decorative band on our journey across the mummy case of Pa'ankanamun reveals a marvelously anthropomorphic version of the Jed Pillar. Let's focus on the central column with the alternating red, blue, and green horizontal stripes. In the upper segment of the column, the yellow dividing bands are somewhat elongated, extending horizontally beyond the width of the column. Together, this is the Egyptian hieroglyph Jed, meaning endurance, stability, and health. It's a stylized representation of the human backbone, specifically the backbone of Osiris. As we can clearly see, it's associated with Osiris through the crossed arms, the royal mummy pose holding the crook and the flail, two implements of kingship, the shepherd and the warrior. The Jed also wears a, an elaborate royal crown of Osiris. Two ostrich feathers stick up above the wavy horns of the ram, on which also rests a small red solar disk in the center. Flanking the feathers, two cobras rise up like the Uraeus, each in turn surmounted by the solar disk. This very distinctive crown of two feathers is similar to, but not the same as the crown we just saw on the ta ware above. The two-feathered crown also commonly appears on votive statuettes of Osiris, placed in the burial chambers of the deceased. There's a great example of this type of statue in the Art Institute's collection, which I hope to explore in a later podcast. I'm particularly intrigued by the pedestal on which the Jed stands. It looks a lot like a doorway, reminiscent of the niched façade of early royal tombs and the surrounding walls of mortuary temples. This niched façade pattern makes an appearance in many different forms of Egyptian funerary art and architecture, on sarcophagi, as the false door, and even in the serech, an early version of the cartouche, the emblem denoting and literally housing the royal name. In the treatment of perspective in Egyptian artistic convention, above generally denotes behind. In this case, if the niched façade is meant to be a doorway to some structure like a sarcophagus, a tomb, or a mortuary temple, behind would be within. So here we have the anthropomorphic, deified, mummified, jed pillar of Osiris enshrined within his tomb. It's too bad the mummy case isn't installed in a freestanding vitrine so it could be seen from behind, because there's actually a giant jed pillar running all along the back of the mummy case. The wedget, or Eye of Horus, is seen here flanked by the jed on either side. The Eye of Horus nowadays has a distinctive apotropaic function, that is, it protects the wearer from evil and averts the evil eye. 
It had a protective function in ancient Egypt too, but also serves as the eyes through which the deceased can look out. We also frequently encounter the wedget painted on the sides of coffins, as amulets decorating the mummy, and carved into scenes decorating the mortuary chapel. And just as we began, so do we end with the winged scarab beetle Kepri, god of rebirth and the rising sun. I know I already covered this in the last podcast on the scarab in ancient Egypt, but it doesn't hurt to reiterate. The appearance of the scarab on the head and at the feet nicely bookends this entire volume of work on life, death, and rebirth in Egyptian funerary thought. The sun god is swallowed at his death in the evening by the goddess Nut, travels through the underworld during the nighttime journey, and is reborn as the rising sun each day. Similarly, Kepri makes his appearance at the head, journeys along the body with its unified message of life and rebirth in the eternal hereafter, and explodes forward at the end, pushing the solar disk aloft to continue the journey and repeat his message for all eternity. So there you have it. That's the end of this episode of the Scarab Solutions Ancient Art Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. Be sure to visit the website at scarabsolutions.com. Just click on the Ancient Art Podcast link to find additional resources, like bigger versions of the photos and links to other useful sites. One recent addition is a link to the Perseus Project, a valuable resource for reading and searching classical texts like that bit from Herodotus above. I've also added a bibliography with some useful books and articles and websites, which is sure to grow over time. And feel free to leave your comments online at scarabsolutions.com. This is your host, Lucas Livingston, signing off. See you next time.